So welcome everybody. I am absolutely thrilled to be hosting this Talks at Google. We have an incredibly special guest with us today, um, Nicholas Thompson. He's an American technology journalist. He's the editor of Wired Magazine, and he's formerly the editor of NewYorker.com. He's also a contributor to CBS News and regularly appears on CBS This Morning. Um, just a little bit of a background about Nick before I turn it over to him. Um, Nick graduated from Stanford University with honors Phi Beta Kappa. Um, he not only was a double major, but he also has a third degree in economics, and he's also an alumni of uh, Phillips Academy Andover. Um, he is not only a journalist, but he also wrote a book. Um, so quite the stud. Um, Nick, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to introduce yourself. Thank you so much. I was saying in that line of my bio that says I'm American technology journalist only exists, I believe, because at one point Wikipedia troll turned me into a Martian technology journalist. <laughs> I was working on a story about Wikipedia. And so thank you for reading that and clarifying for the whole of the internet to see. But thank you, Didi. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Google. Thanks for welcoming me, a non-Martian technology journalist, to come and talk with you. Um, I'm editor in chief of Wired. I'm just gonna get going. Let me share my screen here, and I'll start talking. All right. So what I'm gonna talk about today, and my subject for this talk, is healthcare and telemedicine. I'm gonna talk about it because I think it's one of the areas of the most exciting change happening right now at this moment, both because of coronavirus and where the country is technologically right now, and also because it's an area where I think there are a lot of interesting choices to make, a lot of choices about how we think about data, interoperability, artificial intelligence, the way we build systems. And there are choices that we make now that will have profound consequences down the line for all of us. So the opportunity to speak to Google but my thoughts on this is just extraordinary and wonderful. And I come into this talk humbled and knowing that there are many people at the company and presumably watching who know many more things about every slide that I will put out there. But I'm gonna to try to put this together in a way that is interesting, exciting, and that generates some good discussion at the end. So the structure, six questions about healthcare and the telemedicine, boom, let's get going. So the first question is what's going on right now? And my general hypothesis about coronavirus is that it's compressing five years of technological evolution into one year that has this crazy forcing function on all kinds of industries, including media, which has taken a bunch of the trends affecting my, journal, my career, accelerated them in ways, some of which are beneficial, some of which are quite baleful. It's done this in all kinds of other industries, and most of the effects obviously have been disastrous, right? Our lives have become much harder in many ways. Many of us have lost family members. The results have been horrific. But amid all that horror, there have been real technological growth. And I think that is one of the explanations for why the stock market hasn't really been matching reality. It's because the stock market, if you look at expected future earnings, is taking into account to some degree all of the technological innovation that's happening right now, all of the changes in the way online education happens all of the changes in the efficiencies and how we learn to work from home that eventually we'll be able to combine again with working from the office, God willing, all kinds of things are being built now. They'll be hugely beneficial in the future. And that is probably, probably more true in telemedicine than in almost anything else. And there's so much more data being created, right? Think of all the things you did today that generated some kind of data that the analog equivalent in the past, the pre-March past, where there would not have the data created. And all that data will help power and accelerate artificial intelligence, because as everybody here knows, data is the fuel for artificial intelligence. And more of this is happening in health than anywhere else. Just look at the numbers, right? Claims are up 4,346%. I don't know if that's exactly right right now, but that's March 2020 versus March 2019. And the reason for that, of course, because people didn't want to go in the hospital anymore, right? They were afraid of getting coronavirus in the hospitals. And the medical system, which traditionally has been very slow to innovate, been very slow to allow for interoperability, very slow for the, very slow for the insurance companies to allow for telemedicine, suddenly was forced because there was no other option. And so the insurance industry, which had slowed down telemedicine for a long time, suddenly had to do it. 
And telemedicine and medicine in general is super interesting from a technological perspective because it's the area where data can be most valuable to large populations. We're getting more data about individuals and about treatments and about their success can have profound effects. So on a mass scale, it could not be more useful, but on an individual scale, it could not be more invasive. So privacy could not be more important. And so we've had this mass push online and it's also led to real requirements and needs to look at differential privacy and look at ways of protecting data so that individuals can be protected in large sample sizes. So that's where we are right now. Right? There was kind of a sclerotic healthcare system that suddenly got really pushed to innovate because of the crisis that hit. And because everybody, when they had to move online, like we just became much more comfortable. It became much more comfortable for my mother to consult a doctor over Zoom in April than it would have been in February. Now, of course, of course, all medicine is not going to move online. Right? There are lots of surgeries that are going to require humans. There are lots of complex diagnosis where emotional information will have to be conveyed or where a doctor will really have to sit with the human and talk to them and explain what the options are, where a doctor will really need to see a patient. There's so much more that can be done online. And the amount that can be done digitally is changing every day in ways that are very exciting. And one of the most exciting ways is the amount of data we're able to gather about ourselves. Right? Of course, we can all now take our temperatures right now. We all have you know, watches that can measure our heart rate or more complex information about our hearts and our blood flows. But the cutting edge is the ability to do a sonogram right, at home, which is not possible. Or I recently talked to a doctor. I said, what is the most interesting innovation that has helped your practice. It was a stethoscope somebody could use at home, right? That they could put on their chest and he could listen in like, via an app. So in real time, he could get the same information that he would get putting the stethoscope on their chest in the doctor's office. And that saves a lot of time. It saves the check-in, it saves the drive to the hospital, it saves the risk of getting sick at the hospital, it saves the risk for the doctor of getting sick from the patient, right? It saves a lot of time and creates a lot of interesting new data and information. One of the best ways this is being used that I know about, and I think kind of a wave of the future, is what's gonna be done at a place called Carbon Health. And what they do is they have a patient come in, gather as much information as they can about themselves, right? So ranging from temperature to filling out forms on an app with symptoms and other information, right? All the data that you can gather, fill it out, patient, do it from an app at home before they come into a, a clinic and go and see the doctor. And then the system's AI reads through it. It reads through and it determines what are some likely diagnoses. You know, there's a 92% chance that this patient has pneumonia based on the symptoms they've entered and based on the data they have. Urban Health has, I believe, done more coronavirus tests than any company besides Quest. So they have all the data and they're able to study it. And the doctors there it's not like a computer is diagnosing and saying this person has Lyme disease, this person has pneumonia, but it's saying these are the odds and it can speed it up and make the doctors much more accurate. There's also a huge benefit in the ability of remote medicine to monitor whether people are taking their medicines, whether they're following up. This is a study that came out this week on uh, osteoarthritis treatment and people who are able to be monitored on an app instead of having to come into the doctor every week were much more likely to follow up, well, that's much more likely to use it. I talked to, I talked to another doctor who mentioned treating homeless people and how hard it is to get homeless people to follow up and come in. It's very complicated, but if they have a phone, and many in fact do, this is homeless people in San Francisco, they set the system for monitoring, have the patient videotape themselves as they take the pill, and if that has done, then pay for the phone bill. But there are ways that you can use telemedicine and technology to make every step of the healthcare process more efficient. This is a wonderful quote um, from a recent story in Wired by Kai Fu Lee, one of the great pioneers in artificial intelligence. And he said, explain what he thinks the future of AI and healthcare is. Early one winter morning in the year 2035, I wake up and notice a bit of a sore throat. I get up and walk to the bathroom. I brush my teeth, an infrared sensor in the bathroom mirror takes my temperature. We are close to this, right? A lot of offices have this, right? They're expensive right now. They're not gonna be that expensive in the future. A minute after I finish brushing, I receive an alert from my AI physician. We all have AI assistants. I have one who does my schedule, or I had one who did my schedule until it stopped working. But as you at Google know, AI personal assistants are coming. Maybe there'll be an AI medical assistant. 
So my assistant showed some abnormal measurements from my saliva sample and then I'm running a low fever. The AI suggests that I take a fingertip needle touch blood test, right? One of the next things that's coming beyond just the sonograms and the stethoscopes is the ability to do diagnostic tests at home. Read them very quickly. The people who are working on that are doing some of the most important science and tech work right now. While the coffee is brewing, the PA returns with analysis that it might be coming down with the flu, one of two types of season. So just two video call time slots with the online doctor prescribes a decongestant. Just delivered to my door by drone. The last bit is the only bit I don't buy. I don't think it's going to be delivered by drone. I think it'll be self-driving car. But I think here you can see some of the really interesting future. And every step, everything that is mentioned in this and everything that I've mentioned leading up to here has concerns about privacy, concerns about security, concerns about anonymity. There's a lot to think about, and a lot to worry about, and a lot of protocols we have to get right. But the future is pretty interesting and it's being pushed along much more quickly because of coronavirus than I would have expected at all. So that's question one, what's happening now? Question two, so how does the nature of medical work change? And this is one of the things I think about with basically every industry I think about or I report on or even my own industry of media as artificial intelligence comes. And I believe that AI is moving faster because of Corona than it would have otherwise because of the data being created, because of the way we rely on machines, because of the ways we interact with other humans less. I believe that all forms of AI or many forms of AI, obviously some research projects have been pushed aside as people have prioritized other things, but in general, I think AI is moving forward. And so we all know that AI will change the nature of work and the kinds of jobs that we do, but how should we think about that with medicine? And again, Kaifu, I think has a very good paradigm for this. This is from his book, AI Superpowers. So one thing that computers aren't great at and AI is not great at is creativity, right? Some of this is being solved, but brute force, very easy for a machine. The way humans think about creativity, harder. Um, possible, but harder. It's also true that machines and AI are less good at social interactions than antisocial interactions. If a job requires a lot of connection with human, then it's probably one that won't be replaced as quickly. So Kai Fu very smartly lays out different jobs and in the upper right quadrant are jobs that are pretty safe. The lower left quadrant are jobs that are a little bit in trouble. And so psychiatrist, it's a very social job. It also requires a lot of creativity. Medical researcher is a very interesting one. It requires tons of creativity, but you can do it as a loner. Radiologist, fascinating. I'll talk more about this. But a radiologist where you're analyzing images, right? Obviously, Google has pioneered. Image analysis is something machines can do better than humans, but certain kinds of images are still humans are still better at, and certainly delivering news about a cancer screening a human is better at than a machine. This axis, I think, is a pretty good model for where the medical profession is going that you probably want to add, if you could add another axis for you know, how much physical contact you must, have, you must have with a human, you get a little more information because of coronavirus and we all want to be socially distant. And you can draw a similar axis when it comes to physical tasks, right? Machines and robots are very good at structured environments, moving boxes on assembly lines. It's much harder to do high dexterity tasks. And so you can again draw a similar axis on the x-axis. It's dexterity, structured environments, social, antisocial. I think a lot about this when you know looking at where AI investments in medicine are going. A lot is going into robot surgery, which I wonder about because I think that there's certain elements of surgery, right, like stitches or things that are repetitive, relatively simple motions in structured environments. So stitches are something probably a robot can do. But a lot of highly precise surgery, you're still going to need a human hand. It's going to be better than a robot for some time. I was thinking about this too while watching Elon Musk's Neuralink demonstration Friday night before last, which of course is amazing tech and the ambitions are extraordinary. You should never dis discount Elon's dreams. But there are a couple things that seem implausible, one of which was you know, we'll be able to download our memories, right? We don't know how the electrical signals in our brains become memories. I'm not sure how even understanding all the electrical signals would lead us to be able to download our, our memories. I remember, I remember a song when I was younger and the guy was like, I've been down, I've been loaded, but I've never been downloaded. I don't know who sang that, but I vividly remember him saying that at a club in New York City. So that was part that seemed implausible. And the other part was the idea that a robot will be operating on the top of our skulls. I 
think it's still going to be a human because of the precision required. But that leads me to this conclusion. In medicine, as with so many other fields, AI will be most effective and will transform jobs and provide the most advantage when humans can work with it efficiently. There was a study by Bain that said something like 90% of companies have AI data researchers and 10% of them have actually figured out real uses for AI. But the ones who have are the ones where it's not an AI replacing a human or an AI system replacing a human. It's a human learning to work with AI in a way that enhances what they do or accelerates it. So back to radiology, I, um, I interviewed a radiologist at CES last year. Fortunately, no CES this year. And, or no physical CES in Vegas. And I asked him, I said, so what do you think about AI replacing your work? Because we've been talking about that for a decade. And he said, look, what the AI can do is it massively accelerates it. I can look at so many more images a day because it can sort them. It can say, this is not a tumor. This is almost certainly not a tumor. This almost certainly is a tumor. And the amount of scanning that can be done by a smart image recognition system allows a doctor I spoke with to do do his work much more quickly, much more accurately, and to find the complicated cases where his attention really needs to be put. So that's what I think is happening to the future of work. So let's talk a little bit about health information getting democratized, because that's another thing that has been happening for a long time and is happening particularly during the coronavirus crisis and will continue to happen because of all the transformations that we were going through even before this started. And that have just been accelerated and will only be accelerated as we move towards telemedicine. And again, as we move towards telemedicine, the massive amounts of data are gonna be created and shared as we, as we go through this. And of course there's a risk, right? As you create more medical information, as more stuff goes online, as it becomes more accessible, there's a risk of stress, right? We all know this, right? We, there's a tiny lump on our finger and you know, we go online and we find a red thread that convinces us we're gonna die, right? That, that happens, right? There's a tremendous threat of misinformation. Right? We've seen this with the pandemic, right? We've seen it on YouTube, we see it on Twitter, we see it on Facebook, where a veneer of medical accuracy makes it possible for frightening information to spread extremely quickly in a way that is very damaging for society. One of the challenges with people who run those platforms and shape those algorithms and for those people who use it and are power users or you know, have blue check marks to figure out how to help to counter. Those are real societal problems. As information gets democratized, misinformation gets democratized, and there are psychological side effects. We know that. But there are also incredible benefits. I mentioned Wikipedia at the beginning. The reason I was doing a story on why Wikipedia had become one of the most trusted places on the internet information about coronavirus, right? Billions of people reading the Wikipedia entries. I did this story for CBS in March or April. And I talked to this guy, James Hamblin, who's an emergency room physician in Canada. And so he spends part of his day treating patients and then eight hours, 10 hours a day, editing the Wikipedia pages on coronavirus. And it's because of this, because of the public trust nature of Wikipedia, and the people who spend their lives on it doesn't get any rewards for it. And the way Wikipedia has set up a structure for medical editing that has led to information on that site being pretty darn good, right? We used to joke about information on Wikipedia being ridiculous, right? The bit about me being a Martian technology journalist, it is absolutely true that anybody can change anything. But the coronavirus information on Wikipedia, compare it with other platforms, other information sources, has been pretty extraordinary. And then when I think about information democratization, I think about this story a lot. The story we ran in Wired about a year ago, and it's one of the most important and emotionally moving stories. You know, we, we, we've run in the last year. And so there's this woman and her husband you see in the photograph, and her mother died of fatal familial insomnia. It's a rare prion disease. And she watched her mother die, and she got tested to see whether she had inherited a trait that would lead her to have the same fate in 10 to 20 years. And she did. And so what did she do? You know, suddenly you have, we all have a death sentence, but she has a death sentence that's much shorter than you would expect. It's 10, 20 years. Well, she just finished Harvard Law School and she switches. She and them both switch their careers. They both start earning PhDs in biomedicine. And they both start researching this disease. And they start figuring things out. They start getting clinical trials set up. They, very interestingly, have a baby, but genetically screen the baby so the baby doesn't inherit the same trait. And they're able to use all the information that is available online 
all the stuff that they can access just as civilians, people really interested in this to make genuine progress in medicine and to get closer and closer to seeing her life. And we don't know the outcome of this, but we do know that there will be incredible advances because of the data that's online, because of the democratic access to information, because of what we can all do that allow individuals to use the power of technology and the internet to really make scientific progress. Let's talk about drug discovery. This, of course, is the big topic of the moment. Right? We all are desperate for a coronavirus vaccine. We're all desperate to figure out how we can get through this. And we know that your vaccine won't be everything, obviously. Right? Vaccine may only give us a couple of months of immunity. It may not be distributed widely. We may not have enough doses. There may be side effects. We don't know. A vaccine won't solve everything, but a vaccine is desperately needed for the world to go back to where it was. But the question that interests me the most right now is, well, what happens with the next pandemic? And there are two problems that I think AI and information technology can solve and will solve. And they didn't do it with coronavirus. They did to a very small extent. The problems are, how do you identify drug candidates? And then how do you model whether those drug candidates work? And so with coronavirus, the question is, how do you identify proteins that could possibly work as drug candidates? How do you, of the millions and billions and trillions of possible candidates, how do you choose the ones that work? And ideally, AI can help you do that. Ideally, there's a way of analyzing when the next pandemic hits and we genetically sequence it. Ideally, we'll have the intelligence to be able to look at all the data we have about how the molecules are structured, about the weaknesses, about the way other drugs have performed in other, in other places. But we'll be able to model it much better. Moderna did use this technology, did use machine learning at one step in this process. It's moved towards a vaccine. But this, we really used individuals making specific choices based on their analysis as opposed to a much faster process of machine analysis. But I think as we get more data, as we have gone through the horrifying experiment of the last six months, I think when the next one hits, we'll be much closer to being able to quickly model out a potential vaccine. And then the question is, will we be able to model out a clinical trial, right? I think that the North Star in medical research and in AI should be, and this will take a long time, the ability to simulate a human clinical trial in a machine to be able to have enough understanding of the human body to run a test and to run a million tests, you know, <laughs> in the course of a day, right? As opposed to over six months and to test a thousand drugs, a million drugs simultaneously. If you could build a working model of how a human works, you could go through the process we're going through right now, right? Where we have 12 drug candidates in stage three trials right now, maybe 200 drug candidates somewhere between stage one and stage three. If you could get a thousand drug candidates and at least get them through the stage one processes or the equivalent much more quickly, you would really have done a lot of good. So my hope is that AI modeling, increased computing power, increased processing power, better data will lead us to these two goals, drug discovery and drug modeling, potential trials. We're not there, you know, we're not close, but with the speed of innovation, more law, I think this is something to really watch and something to really put our minds on. And then one of the questions that comes of this is, well, let's say that does happen. Who will use the computing power and what drugs will we look for? And this is where I want to talk a little bit about the possibilities or the responsibility of Google. You know, I love that there's a, an AI center in, in Ghana now, in Accra. When I was a young reporter, I spent a lot of times, some of my earliest stories were writing for the New York Times and the Boston Globe from across about technological transformation, about tech companies being built there. There's, I guess the first internet cafe was coming up there. I went to a, a city a couple hours north of the capital where they wanted to start a, you know, an outsourcing center where they're going to work with Microsoft. It didn't work out. But technology in Ghana is one of the you know, things I've written about and cared about the most in my career. And I think it's an important example now because if you think through the way this will all work, and if those two things I just talked about, drug discovery happen, what you're going to want is you're going to want the awesome computing powers of the biggest technologies, biggest technology companies in the world. You will want that aimed not just at diseases that strike people in the 
wealthy West, right? Not just at diseases that change my life expectancy from 75 to 85 or 85 to 75, but at malnutrition, at malaria. And so it's gonna be really important that there be access and that there be access around the world and that access to the most powerful computers, access to the best algorithms, access to the best data sets is democratized. And you can't, it's not like all the big tech companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Alibaba, right? It's not like they can just give all their data, all their best tools to everybody in the world, right? Private companies with responsibility to shareholders. But there are going to be ways, they're going to be private public partnerships, ways that companies with the computing power and the brilliant AI minds can work with governments, work with nonprofits, and really make sure that as we go through this incredible period of innovation in medicine, that the results are fairly and evenly distributed around here and around the world. Let's go to question five. There's a related question. Could telemedicine worsen inequality? Because of course, on first blush, it seems like telemedicine should be an equalizer. One of the reasons why medical care is distributed unequally is just the location of hospitals. There are better hospitals in more affluent areas. With telemedicine, theoretically, it should be the same for everybody. We all should have equal access to the same doctors. We just have to get online. But as we know now, not everybody has equal access. You know, there are plenty of places in the United States that do not have access to broadband. There's a shocking failure in areas in rural America where we have not solved this problem. And so if telemedicine ends up having all these magical effects, imagine people out in farm country, out in rural areas who can't benefit. Right? And you can imagine older people who aren't as comfortable with technology, not getting the benefits despite having the greatest need for it. So solving this issue of access, broadband access has been a problem in America for a long time. It is now an even more pressing problem as we enter this era of real innovation in AI and in healthcare. We're also gonna to have to think through issues of equity and fairness in the AI algorithms that underlie it all. Now, this is something that Google has put a lot of work in, has published working papers on some of the pioneers and the philosophy you have or do work at Google. But there have been studies about biases in AI and healthcare that are rather troubling. My colleague, Tom Simonite, who's a fantastic AI reporter, wrote a piece about a hospital system that had used AI to determine patient care, and then afterwards analyzed it and determined that even though race had not been coded into the data sets that were used to determine care, the hospital had been biased against black people because of the ways that race is encoded in other variables in the system, right? And in determining who would be in what line to say get a kidney transplant, people were implicitly favored by race, in some races over others, and you can't have that we can't have that, right? There do need to be some kind of biases in the system, right? Certain patients who are need more care need to, to be favored, or patients who are more likely to come back need to be favored, but you, we need to be able to build the algorithms in ways that don't have the kind of bias that Tom wrote about. And then the really complicated medical ethical question is gonna come five years, 10 years, two years, I don't know, when we have the ability to genetically engineer our children using CRISPR and other technologies. And when we have the capacity to change their genes, to make them stronger, smarter, to make them retain more, to make them better soccer players, I don't know. We saw the first experiments of this in China last year, testing whether you could genetically modify a baby to make it less susceptible to HIV. And of course, we should want that. It may turn out to be that the particular gene that was modified by that particular doctor was the wrong target. But how are we gonna think through this? What will we allow? Will we allow genetic modifications that prevent people from getting diseases? Will we be more reticent about it? Will we allow other enhancements? Will people who want to make their babies smarter or stronger, better memories, go to other countries that have more lax regulations? This is gonna be one of the most interesting philosophical, moral, and technological questions of the next coming years. It's one of the things I think we need to think profoundly about. I haven't seen someone who's gotten a really great framework on this yet. So the last question, the sixth question is the, in some ways, the biggest question, the hardest question, the most pressing question. And I spent a lot of time writing about and thinking about the technological split between the United States and China that we've seen over the last few years, but we've really seen over the last year and maybe even more over the last month, right? As we've seen with TikTok and so much else, you know, the crisis over Huawei building to the crisis over TikTok. I wrote a piece with my friend and colleague Ian Bremer about you know, two years ago about the coming split with China over artificial intelligence and the risks the risk to creating a new Cold War, 
in Cold War where some countries choose to go with China, right? Where they have a 5G network built with Huawei equipment and then Chinese apps work on top of it where you can use WeChat and Alibaba and then the rest of the world built on Ericsson equipment and Western equipment where you can use Google and Facebook and Amazon and how terrifying that would be for the world. Well, of course, that's where we're headed. We seem to be headed right now, but maybe we'll be able to pull back. And there are huge risks, efficiency risks, cultural risks, even risks of conflict. Traditionally, when one country has become gone from being the richest to being the second richest country on earth, there's something called a Thucydides trap. There's potential for war. That war becomes more likely the more decoupled the countries are. And the same thing is going to happen in medicine or seems to be happening in medicine, potentially. The best way to respond to coronavirus or any pandemic would be to have the best research and the best data from across the world translated into languages that everybody can understand, shared research about treatments to be shared. But we've entered a situation where the United States is blaming China, China is blaming the United States, where there's some collaboration among the great researchers and brilliant minds in both countries. And that's not a great system to optimize world outcomes. What you would really like is maximal information sharing and then structured systems, whether through the United Nations, the World Health Organization, to make sure that information is shared, vaccines are fairly and equitably distributed, all kinds of things like that. We are moving more away from that, it seems like, every day. And that is a, that is a huge and pressing problem. So those are the six questions. Those are the things I'm interested in with telemedicine. What's happening right now? How does the nature of medical work change what happens as health information is democratized? How does drug discovery change? Could telemedicine worsen inequality? And will there be a medical split with China? I'm Nicholas Thompson. This is how you can reach me. I love hearing from people. You can reach out to me from email and all over social media. I used to have a very active Google Plus account. I'm reachable. You know, you can DM me. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Nick. That was fantastic. Um, I want to just go back to what you said about the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's really pushing against like the structural barriers that have previously slowed health system investment. Um, and so for more than a decade, people have been talking about digital health, right? It's been celebrated as this game changer in the healthcare industry. But while tech kind of made digital health possible, it's really the providers, the payers, and the consumers that have been much slower to adopt than what was anticipated. Um, and so I know there's some challenges that are associated with healthcare and interoperability. Um, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so that is a hard question, right? And it gets back to one of the things I mentioned at the beginning where Medicine and healthcare tech is the area where the potential benefits of data sharing are the highest and where the potential privacy risks are also the highest. And so you have these two forces working against each other. You have every incentive to share the maximum amount of data and every incentive not to. And so I think a lot of the problem solving will come from, you know, the folks working on encryption, interoperability systems, ways of making sure that I can take data from A, transport it to B without privacy risks, security risks. And we are making progress on that. There are people working very hard at different companies to solve this problem. Maybe you can have maximum sharing certainly across one company with other companies. I know this is a problem that Google has worked on immensely. It is also a problem that we have not solved. And it's not just a, a privacy and encryption problem. It is also a like archaic systems, right? So healthcare has this really complicated problem too, where if you have a machine from 2003 that works, you really don't want to take it out. If you take it out and something stops working, like the costs of having a machine not work for a small amount of time are so high. And so a lot of people are running these incredibly archaic systems. So it's very hard to transfer data. This is why when ransomware attacks happen, you always read about these healthcare systems where they're running, you know, Windows 95, which has a vulnerability they didn't update. And it's because you know, you have machines that nobody wants to turn off at any moment and run the upgrade process on. So there is a lot of infrastructure work and it is slowing stuff down and solving it is one of the great uh, issues for, for everybody working in this field. I think traditionally data has really been siloed, right? It's not necessarily yeah. been used to the benefit of patients. Um, so how do you allow healthcare providers to easily, like securely and instantaneously collaborate while caring for their patients? So, yeah, yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of it was building, you know, building the trust of the patients, showing them the benefits they can get from. A lot of it is going to be working with Congress and state regulators on HIPAA regulations, making sure that there are options 
you know, the carbon health example I mentioned is a good one where the patients, as I understand it, have come to trust the system and realize that if you enter all of this data, that the company will keep it secure and you'll get your diagnosis faster and more accurately. And then, you know, the risk, of course, is if there is a hack or a terrible story and the reputation gets changed, then trust diminishes. So you need systems and regulations that maximize the reasons for trust. You need people understanding it and being willing to give their trust. And then you need researchers who really think thoughtfully about the risks and who, if they're studying a data set, make sure to do it in a way that respects the users, knowing that if they don't and it comes out, it will cause real problems for the field. So there are different problems on kind of, there are different responsibilities for everyone everywhere in the stack of this particular question. And I think the goal is really to make sure that you're helping companies organize all of the healthcare data that they have um, and then making sure that crucial information, just like what you said, it, it needs to be useful, but it also needs to be very secure. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Useful and, and secure. <laughs> And then how do you do more meaningful analysis, right, based on the data? And how do you use machine learning tools to be able to enable and, and glean those customer insights, those patient insights that physicians need so much? Yeah, right. I mean, so that's, again, and then, you know, there you need, you know, you need the patients to trust, right, to say, to click the box that just allows the data to be shared. You need the doctors to be willing to trust it. And also for the doctors to recognize that when they're gathering information from their patients, they need to make their handwriting good, right? So that not just they, but everybody else. So it's machine readable and the system can input it. And to understand the consequences and the stakes and then for the hospital to make sure that it's sharing information within its borders. And then for the hospital network to share it across the network. And then for the hospital network to share it with public databases or other hospitals that you know follow similar protections and can keep data safe and help researchers improve. Absolutely. Yeah. And I also want to like double click on something else that you said about focusing on democratizing AI to really improve healthcare, right? Yeah. So machine learning presents like these incredible opportunities, right, for enterprises to be able to derive those new insights about the data that they've collected. Um, yeah. I just want to kind of hear a little bit more of uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, so it does, right? So the democratization of AI is an interesting question, right? Because what we're seeing is Basic AI tools are becoming much more available. Basic AI understanding is becoming much more common, right? The number of people who study AI in the US and certainly in China is you know, going through the roof. But the number of data sets, the number of useful data sets isn't, you know, isn't as high as I would like, right? If I were a government official, if I were advising either the Donald Trump campaign or the Joe Biden campaign, I would strongly recommend that they create a government program to generate as many data sets as possible and create a sort of a repository of information for AI. And Trump actually, this is an issue where Trump has been with science and tech starting a whole series of new AI and quantum research labs. I would say that one government policy should be to create mass data sets that are publicly accessible, right? And the, then that solves a couple problems. One, it creates data sets that researchers doing sort of foundational research of kind that most companies aren't incentivized to do, right? Because it won't really affect the bottom line can do. Right? You don't want AI just being used on problems where there's monetary return, right? And so, you know, companies obviously will have will have that incentive. So it provides for some fundamental research. It allows for more competition, right? It allows, it makes it much easier for a startup to create, you know, reduces barriers to entry, right? Once, you know, AI feeds on data, you need more data, have better AI. And that's not true of all forms of AI, but basically for machine learning, it seems to be at least partially true. You don't want to create barriers to entry, so it creates a more competitive marketplace allows for startup, allows for better research. So if either the campaign manager, if either Trump or Biden is listening, I really think this is this is definitely the winning issue of, of, of 2020. You know, campaign on public data repositories for fundamental AI research, and like that is your path to um, the winning Wisconsin. Yeah, and I think by granting access to better flow of data, it's really gonna help to kind of inspire those new discoveries with, with AI. And that's gonna lead to the insights that we're looking for to improve patient outcomes. Um, so I, I think the other part is just gonna be easy to use pre-trained models. Like, do you have that? Does it allow for the automatic classification of like images and videos yep. and parsing content from articles or surveys? And how do you convert audio into text? Um, mm -hmm. I think all of that is gonna be very key. 
I have one more question for you and then we're gonna throw it to the audience and we'll take some audience questions. Does that sound good to you? That sounds great. I'll be happy okay. to answer questions. Everybody. Okay, well, I've got one more question for you. So why do you think digital health startups keep failing? What's going on? Why do digital health startups keep failing? Well, you know, most startups fail, right? Like it's a, <laughs> right. there is a high percentage, you know, and it's very hard to run a startup, right? And, you know, I helped run a startup for for years. I know that the, you know, it's quite hard to, you know, to get the capital, to solve the initial problems, to be a manager for the first time, right? There can be lots of winner take all economies. But I think the main reason is the, the, the bit that you mentioned in your first question, which is the complexity of regulations, privacy standards, and data interoperability. It creates, it means that to succeed, you know, one of the huge market inefficiencies in medicine is that success isn't just dependent on the quality of your ideas, it's your ability to navigate the legal system and the rules and the privacy restrictions. And as that complexity is added in the system, it becomes much harder for a startup, right? So you can have a startup with the most brilliant idea and the most brilliant founders, you know, and even have sufficient capital, but if they can't figure out the regulatory environment, they don't have the right lawyers and understanding of paper requirements, or, you know, they can't figure out, you know, at a more complex level, how exactly the marketplace by which you will sell this device or this idea to these particular customers, can't figure that out, then the, then the startup fails. So I think actually it's, it's closely, closely tied to the, to the first question, the first question you asked. And, you know, that's another, that's a great example. That's another great example of why, if you could make the baseline of medicine sort of more efficient, if you could make everything a little more interoperable, a little more clear, people feel a little more secure about their privacy, you would have mass innovation, not just from the existing companies, not just from existing data, but by allowing you know, clearer entry points for startups and clearer paths to success, then you get real benefits. Totally. Yeah, yeah I, I think you nailed it. It's just the complexity and the fact that it is a regulated industry um, and that digital health products really have to appeal to individual customers um, and also to a complicated landscape of stakeholders, right? From doctors to yep. patients, to regulators, to insurers. Um, yep. So I think that definitely makes it significantly harder. All right, so let's take a question from the audience. Um, we have a question um, from Camillo. How close are we to patients having full ownership and portability of their <laughs> our data? When will I have to stop filling out the same forms over and over and over again? That is a great question. It is a great question. I don't know the answer, right? I know that there are lots of places that are working on this, right? Oscar, for example, which is you know affiliated with Google and right as you see the you know major Google Ventures investment, is trying very hard <laughs> to solve this problem. I think that every healthcare company is indeed trying to solve this. I believe there are some steps in the right direction, right? I actually like I was surprised that when we got a coronavirus test the other day and I you know, went into city and me and like the forms were pretty populated and I was stunned and I was so happy, right? And it just meant I didn't have to touch the screen in a place where a whole bunch of people have had coronavirus. So baby steps, uh, I wish it was going faster. I don't know when it will be. I, I think it's the holy grail. I think we're all hoping for it. Um, yeah, and it's important, like, and maybe in fact, right, this, you know, sort of the thing I mentioned flippantly there about touching the screen, like as the medical system Right, you're, you're weighing cost and benefits, right? You have to weigh out the extra form. Partly it's redundancy, partly it's because we don't wanna fix the system that you know, would be necessary to fix to solve this problem. But then you weigh the cost, which is somebody sits in the, you know, in the lobby waiting for an extra two minutes where they may be exposed to coronavirus. Maybe that the risks of going to the hospital are what pushes the medical system to make some improvements here. That's what you can hope for. No, I agree. Um, and then let's talk about like need-driven innovation. Do you feel like yeah. that's something that's needed in, in healthcare in particular, rather than going down to this this concept of let's like do something quickly and just put it out there um, that might be requiring a, a different approach just given the, the complexity of the landscape? Well, you kind of need both, right? You need people who identify a real need, right? Like, so there are lots of people, there are lots of people suffering from X, Therefore, let's build a solution to X, right? Kind of ties into the question I was raising about drug discovery, right? So what is the most efficient way to do drug discovery, 
Is it to let the market side, in which case you presumably get drug discovery aimed at, you know, people who can pay in places with insurance, right? You get a lot of uh, you know, over allocation of resources into male fertility, for example, mm -hmm. right? And an under allocation of resources into malnutrition, right? And an under allocation of resources into rare prion diseases, right? And so you need both. You need both like market analysis of where drug discovery should be. And then you also need public health organizations or government officials that also create incentives to, you know, redirect the stream in other directions so that there's, you know, water flowing in all the right places, right? If you just let the market decide, then you get some inefficiency. So I think you need great research, open access to data, the things that we've talked about, and also smart policy making, both at the government and the NGO level to make sure that there's allocation that helps whatever ethical framework you have, whether it's to help the most number of people in need or to you know, help the person who is in the worst off situation, depending on what your ethical framework is and how you think about it philosophically, there should be some allocation of resources that matches that framework. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, we have one more question, a couple more questions for you. So let, let's get to the next one. For us asking, are there any books you're currently reading that you would like to recommend? I think books that I am currently reading that I, that I would like to recommend. Yeah, well, so the, you know, AI Superpowers, I thought was a, was an absolutely wonderful book. It's funny, you know, I've been, I thought the last three books I've read are, um, I'm, I'm working on a story that involves a disappearance, and so they're all about disappearances and about endurance. Alexis Hutchinson's book about endurance, which I'm reading right now, is fantastic, just for a physiological, uh, a study of the physiology of how humans work and why they fatigue which cross both from athletics into mental endurance, I think is fabulous. And so that's, um, that's what I was reading this morning. Nick, you have a reputation of being a very highly functioning individual with very little sleep. <laughs> so. <laughs> that, Aditi and I went to high school together. That may, that may have been true back then. I, you know, I, 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 I try to sleep a lot now. It's very good for your brain. Okay, we have a couple more questions for you. Um, Jimmy wants to know, Better health tech will help people live longer and healthier. How should we think about the strain of consequent population growth on climate and other resources? Should we even be concerned? Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that is an amazing question. And I think the answer is you have to separate them. Um, because if you don't separate them, you end up in this you know, sort of horrible quagmire where you start putting value judgments on the most personal decisions, like a decision to have multiple children, or where you, you know, something the environmental movement has, has dealt with for a long time, right? How should the environmental movement feel about immigration, right? On the one hand, some environmentalists are like, well, you let more people come to the United States, then you're putting more resource strain on the planet. And people are like, give me a break, right? You have the resources. Like, you make your immigration policy based on other factors. And I feel like I feel like the goal, you should just set two separate goals and make policy decisions as though they're independent, even though in some way they aren't, right? One goal is have the maximum number of people live the maximum number of years in the healthiest way possible, right? And have the benefits of healthcare distributed equally across the globe, across races, across genders, across geographic areas. You should have a moral framework that wants to maximize the number of years that people live that you are healthy, happy, and, and content, right? And there are all kinds of complicated next questions that you can deal with, right? And there are amazing ethical questions when you think about who should a vaccine be given to, right? Should a vaccine be given to somebody on the front lines? Should it be given to someone who's young because you're going to save more years? Or should it be given to someone who's old because they're more at risk? Should it be given to someone who's social because they're more likely to be a node, right? They're like amazing ethical questions there. And they're fascinating ethical questions about where healthcare should get. On the environmental question, I think you separate them. You maximize years, life, happiness, all those factors, and you try to minimize impact on the planet. And you maybe square the circle by hoping and saying that, you know, as you maximize the years of people and the lives they live, that you'll maximize the number of people who will be able to come up with solutions to climate change, right? Because I believe, as do a lot of folks, that the solution to well, that there are many solutions to climate change, but it's not just reducing impact. It's also about 
smart mitigation. It's about geoengineering. It's about figuring out ways to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. It's about figuring out ways to build seawalls, make cities that are more resilient to climate change. It's about humans figuring out how to limit the forest fires to the future, fight the ones that exist right now. And so my hope would be you can get both, maximize the number of years of humans and get those humans working towards solutions in climate change. But that is that is a dagger of a question. Congratulations on that one. That was awesome. <laughs> we got one more question. Harshad is asking, how do you think patients will react to technology? So for example, a bot or some machine learning algorithm, diagnosing them or treating them instead of a human? Oh, that's a good question too, <laughs> right? Because, you know, many won't like it, right? There are examples where it's very beneficial, right? So one example that exists even in 2020 is elderly patients who are quite lonely, you know, or you know, maybe suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's who have bots or home health aids, care aids, some of which may be partly controlled by humans, some of which may be robotic, that give them some, some comfort and some monitoring, right? Like, is it ethical if you have an elderly parent to have a, you know, a robot dog that gives them some comfort and watches them and has a camera and can alert you if, if they fall, right? That is an interesting ethical question. And I think it does give some comfort to some people. On the other hand, there's no question that if I were to receive a tough medical diagnosis, right? If someone would say that I had coronavirus or that I had coronavirus that it, you know, wasn't getting better and I was heading towards the worst outcome. I would have a much easier time processing if it was another human. I could look them in the eye and I'd feel the empathy and the understanding and I could ask questions and have a conversation about the risks than I would even with a hyper-intelligent AI that might give the exact same answers. So I do think that there's gonna be a real role for humans and human empathy in diagnosis and giving medical care, but there'll also be increasingly areas where we're willing to accept you know, my coronavirus test, right? I got my coronavirus test by email, I got the results and I was negative and fine, right? Um, I didn't need a doctor to call me up and tell me that and talk me through what it meant. I, I know what that means. So there are plenty of situations where it's gonna be fine having a bot, having an AI system and somewhere you really will want it. And you know, the smart medical systems will understand that balance and figure out where to go. Yeah, no, I, get I think machine learning presents tremendous opportunities for, for enterprises to be able to derive new insights. Uh, but at the same time, that human connection is, is always is needed, especially when it comes to, to your personal health. We have yeah. one more question from Jacqueline. So Jacqueline's asking if you can make one device that will completely change the way we manage health today, what would that be? Assuming this will allow us for novel data or signals, et cetera. Right, if I could make one device. Huh. Um, well, you know, the device that I would want to make today would be the device that immediately allows you to diagnose coronavirus in your home, you know, within five minutes, right? So that would be, and that would dramatically change our healthcare response, right? Because you would know you could test yourself every day, you could test everybody every day, and kids could go back to school, right? And test yourself for corona and then come into school. But I think the question is broader, right? And it's the, you know, what is next after, you know, we have the sonogram, the stethoscope, you know, the biggest answer would be something that can actually read brain signals, but that's implausible. So I'll skip that too. I suppose the thing that I would, you know, so maybe I'll answer this, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the right framework to answer the question. I do think diagnostic tests are a huge part of it. I do think that ultimately it will involve brain imaging. I would say at the moment, the thing you know, personally that I would be most concerned about is a heart attack, right? My father and my grandfather have died of heart attacks. You know, I enjoy long distance sports, which may protect me or may, may put me more at risk. Um, and right now we have a lot of data on how our hearts work that generates huge amounts of false positives. So having realistic analysis that can allow you to quickly determine whether you are at risk of a heart attack and need to take corrective action would be extremely useful. And that is something that, you know, lots and lots of people suffer from. So maybe that's how I'll answer that fabulous question. That's fantastic. We only have a few more minutes left. Um, I just want to kind of highlight that, Nick, you are multi-talented. Not only do you run a ton of marathons, but you also have released three albums, right? You're quite <laughs> the musician. That's true. I do love to, I, I played guitar before I became a journalist. That was a fun, <laughs> 
a fun thing to do. And yeah, so lots of work with her. And it's come back a little bit during coronavirus, having to play my kids to sleep every night. <laughs> All right. Um, so anything that you want to close out with? You only have a few more minutes. This was I quite a treat for me. Thank you. And it was a treat for me. I just want to say thank you. And thank you to, you know, thank you to Google for inviting me and letting me talk about this. And I think that, you know, as I said at the beginning, the reason why I'm so interested in this topic and so interested in particular talking to Google are the, you know, a lot of the choices that we'll make about access to data and privacy and encryption and the choices we'll make about you know, where bots, you know, what role they play in the healthcare system and how we can change the healthcare system to improve interoperability. A lot of it will depend on, um, you know, make people work at the big technology companies and product managers and engineers and managers and not just Google, but all of them you know, thinking through these complex problems and making the right choices. So thanks for having me here and um, reach out, email me and uh, subscribe to Wired. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Have a lovely day, Dee. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>